Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Nate Evans. I'm an active transportation planner at the Maryland Department of Transportation Secretary's Office. I'd like to welcome you to our fiscal year 2022 Maryland Department of Transportation's grant webinar. And today we'll have a specific focus on bicycle pedestrian project funding opportunities. The purpose of today's webinar is to review this year's available grant funding through the Maryland Highway Safety Office, the Recreational Trails Program, the Transportation Alternatives Program, the Safe Routes to School Program, and the Kim Lafier Bikeways Network Program. During today's webinar, we'll review each of these grant programs in detail. We'll take a brief poll at the end and then have time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, all participants are in are muted and in participate participate only mode. For the questions at the end, please use the chat the questions function located on the webinar. Uh, go to webinar function. We will be able to tab your questions during the course of the presentation and then we'll review those at the end. You'll also notice that we have five handouts available for today's presentation. It includes uh, slides from today's presentation. So if you miss any of the links that are in today's presentation, you can always go back and click those in the PDF. We also have uh, three other handouts available, uh, information sheets on specific grants, and then also the MDOT Bikeways Project Cost Estimator, which we will also review in today's presentation. Uh, let's see. So with that, I again welcome you all to uh, today's presentation, and I would like to First, start off with um, Jeff Dunkel from the Maryland Highway Safety Office. Great, thanks, Audience. Nate. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Nate. Um, yeah, I appreciate being uh, first first one here. So, uh, I had a little computer glitch this morning, but um, I'm going through my slides, and Nate's going to be uh, changing them for me on the presentation. Um, anyway, my name's Jeff Dunkel, and uh, I've uh, been with the Maryland Highway Safety Office for over three years now, heading into my fourth year, and this is actually the fourth um, uh, presentation uh, seminars uh, that we've done on these grants, and uh, they've uh, been a really great tool to help everybody realize the opportunities we have in the state of Maryland for grant funding for a variety of projects related to bicycle and pedestrian facilities and safety. So really, really pleased to be part of this. Uh, I want to start today by uh, uh, my portion to talk about the Maryland Highway Safety Office. Uh, we are the Maryland Department of Transportation Motor Vehicle Administration Highway Safety Office. And if you can say that 10 times fast, you get an extra $5,000 in your grant. Um, anyway, we are dedicated to saving lives and preventing injuries by reducing motor vehicle crashes through the administration of a comprehensive network of traffic safety programs. And I'm going to describe uh, some of those to you here today. Uh, the grants uh, for the Maryland Highway Safety Office, important to note that we are targeting changing of behaviors, not necessarily facilities. Um, we work with the change of facilities, but we actually, uh, through education and enforcement activities, focus our efforts on changing how people um, you know, can be safer in their behaviors on the roadways. Um, so that's, that's the purpose of our, of our office and our grants. Where does this funding come from? Uh, two sources. First, uh, we have, uh, through the FAST Act, uh, federal, uh, uh, federal uh, transportation um, funding uh, that we that we get you know on an annual basis uh, is is directed to NHTSA, uh, that's the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and they in turn uh, direct that to us. In addition, uh, we are fortunate to have uh, support and funding from the state of Maryland as well, and so we do get additional funds from the state of Maryland, and that is important for two reasons, which I'll I'll talk about when we get to the scheduling. <clears throat> With highway traffic safety, uh, we essentially build our efforts on the four E's. Uh, and you probably, most of you are, are familiar with these. Um, engineering, which I, um, as I mentioned, is the road design and the actual physical structures. We do not fund uh, any projects for engineering. Uh, that is handled by our, our colleagues in SHA and MTA and other agencies, but we, we do not do any funding uh, for engineering projects. So that's, please uh, note that because uh, we'll have to, to decline any such uh, uh, applications we get from engineering efforts. However, we um, do fund, and highlighted in yellow here, education and enforcement 
as well as emergency medical services, especially when it relates to uh, researching crashes and things like that. Um, and so uh, those are sort of the, that's the bailiwick of what we focus on in the Maryland Highway Safety Office. And we have a series of, of um, a lot of grant opportunities to, to support education enforcement and emergency medical services. <clears throat> The linchpin, or what sort of is the foundation of our entire program, is the Strategic Highway Safety Plan. Um, the uh, Maryland Highway Safety Office grants that we issue uh, have to be in support of the Maryland Strategic Highway Safety Plan. So essentially, uh, there needs to be a, a connection or correlation between what we're funding and how that's moving us towards uh, towards our goals in the Strategic Highway Safety Plan. The main objective of the plan is to reduce fatalities and serious injuries. But it's important to note that in Maryland, we have now set the goal of zero um, for 2030. We're trying to achieve, well, our goal is to achieve uh, zero uh, motor vehicle related fatalities and injuries by 2030, which is a very uh, ambitious goal. Um, and we do that by setting a series of interim targets. And uh, each uh, as strategic highway safety plan uh, is essentially a five-year plan. And we just issued uh, last month our, um, our new plan for 2021 through 2025. And uh, the link here on the screen um, shows you, um, or you click on that and you can actually um, uh, go right to the document that's posted online and, um, and we'll give you a sense of what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And it will cover a variety of emphasis areas besides uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety. It covers such things as impaired driving and distracted driving and those types of things. But um, our focus today will be on the, um, you know, the Maryland uh, um, the bicycle and pedestrian safety um, focus. <clears throat> Who's eligible for grants? Uh, you must be a nonprofit. Uh, you can be a government agency or a regional authority like a, a metropolitan planning organization. Um, you can uh, be a law enforcement agency or you can be an institute of higher learning. So what types of projects do we fund? I always direct uh, folks who are interested in applying for a grant to the uh, document that NHTSA puts out. Uh, the last one, I think, is the 2017 edition of something called Countermeasures That Work. Uh, these are a series of, uh, of measures that have been put in for traffic safety, and there's a whole chapter dedicated to pedestrian and another chapter to, uh, dedicated to bicycle um, uh, programs and, and um, activities that have actually shown to be successful in reducing pedestrian and uh, bicycle crashes. And um, so the link here is, is the latest edition. And I would sort of encourage folks to take a look at this to get a sense, maybe to spark some ideas and, and, and uh, start the creative uh, wheels turning about you know what kind of projects in your local jurisdiction uh, you might be able to apply for a grant. And these uh, are, tend to be pr proven, proven uh, activities that we are eager to fund. Um, I will say that we are also very interested in pursuing pilot projects because that's where these great ideas become countermeasures that work come from. And so we are always open to new projects uh, that might be developed at a local level and, it's, and if they can be shown or be described as having some benefit for the state or a region, uh, you know, then we would of course be interested in uh, pursuing that as well. We've had several projects since I've been with the uh, Maryland Highway Safety Office that have been sort of uh, cutting edge innovations um, that uh, we have, uh, um, you know, had some, had some success in uh, pushing forward. So I would encourage you not to be, uh, just because it's not in that document countermeasures at work, doesn't mean we're not interested in pursuing it. We, we definitely are. So if you've got a good idea, let us know what that is. Um, and uh, the third primary um, measure that we use to try to uh, decide where we're going to put our funding for grants is um, what we call our action items, which are described in the uh, uh, Strategic Highway Safety Plan uh, emphasis area strategies. And that's one of the handouts that Nate mentioned. In there, we have six strategies that I'm going to go through and describe briefly here. But um, under each of those strategies, we currently have identified with our group of uh, uh, strategy leads um, a series of action items that we're trying to implement. If any of your grants fit into any of those categories that can address any of those action items, and that becomes a very strong contender for funding. And uh, we, we're looking for we're looking for activities that will support uh, the action items that are spelled out in our um, strategies. Okay, so I just kind of want to briefly describe the uh, the, the six um, six strategies. Uh, first one is data. We try to base everything on on what we do to have a data driven program. We collect, analyze, and evaluate data 
trying to identify issues, audiences, and locations of where we can do um, and take a, um, you know take act action to try to uh, make the roads safer. Infrastructure, uh, as I mentioned, it isn't really something that we focus on, but very much working a partnership with SHA, trying to improve roadway with safety environments, um, and we are trying to use what's called a safe systems approach. And the idea is that we need to design roadways that are forgiving, so when people make mistakes, they don't uh, get seriously injured or killed from their mistakes. Um, <clears throat> and the sort of the bread and butter of my office is the outreach education efforts which are promoting public awareness, education, and training with uh, me and conducting media campaigns. A couple of examples are the Street Smart campaign and the most recently launched uh, Look Alive campaign in Baltimore. Um, and then we support enforcement actions um, you know, through, we do improved enforcement initiatives that uh, promote safe behaviors. And then finally, our last, uh, last uh, two, strategies is legislation. We work to try to support policies and, and uh, legislative actions that will uh, advance safety. And um, and then we try to also um, look at the, this is a new um, strategy for us in the ped pedestrian bicycle safety emphasis area, but we are trying to uh, look at engineering opportunities and technologies um, that will, um, you know, basically provide uh, safer cars that uh, might uh, be able to avoid cr crashes and collisions and, um, and apply technology wherever possible. Uh, what you see here is a display of a uh, something that we funded, uh, a grant uh, with Anne Arundel uh, Police Department to try to use an automated system to identify cars that were passing the um, drivers too closely um, with you know, closer than three foot of, of clearance. And um, and we funded uh, this project uh, in Anne Arundel County a couple of years ago. So um, this this uh, these displays at the bottom here sort of show how we have legislation about passing vehicles, um, you know, coupled with you know an, an example of actually police trying to enforce that law when it came into effect using technology. So kind of ties all these together. And finally, <clears throat> I just want to um, mention our law enforcement projects. Um, I'm not. We have a whole separate group that deals with law enforcement agencies. And so I, if you have an interest in this, I encourage you to get in touch with me and we will put you in touch with the uh, appropriate um, uh, law enforcement liaison for your jurisdiction. But, um, you know, we did, generally we focus on changing behaviors and reducing fatalities um, by, you know, enforcing, uh, you know, uh, traffic safety laws. And oftentimes that's funded through overtime uh, enforcement actions uh, that uh, police are engaged in, such as crosswalk um, uh, what we call crosswalk details, where we have a, um, a decoy in the crosswalk, and if a uh, driver doesn't stop, they get pulled over and get a citation. Uh, and we're also conducting training of law, uh, on enforcement of law enforcement officers on uh, best management practices for improving uh, uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety. So how to apply? Uh, this is what I mentioned on the difference between state and national uh, NHTSA funding, is that um, two different uh, timelines. Um, the, the, both have the same deadline of needing to submit the application by March 12th. Uh, however, on, um, for the fiscal year for the federal government is uh, October 1st through September 30th. <clears throat> so any grants that we fund through uh, NHTSA would essentially be become available October 1st and then uh, have to be expended by October, uh, September 30th of the following year, 2022. Um, however, with state-funded projects, our fiscal year begins July 1st. So that funding would become available in July and uh, have to be expended by the end of June. So um, that's an important uh, item to note there. Um, applications are submitted through online through a grant application system called GPS, Grants for, for Projects uh, for, for Safety. And um, the deadline for the submittal for Maryland Highway Safety Office is, is a little earlier than the, the other um, programs you're going to be hear, hearing about. Our deadline is March 12th. So basically by the end of the day, March 12th, it's Friday, uh, we would need to receive your, your application. And, um, and that's um, uh, the, the link there at the bottom of the page is uh, the, the link to that online um, uh, system. <clears throat> I also want to br mention briefly that we have a series of uh, local um, uh, liaisons, uh, what we call our partnership re resource and outreach folks, the pros. Um, they work in specific geographic areas. Uh, in this map, you can see we in the southern area, um, we have uh, uh, Mike Baumgartner, and uh, in the northern area around Baltimore and north, we have uh, uh, Julie Quitter, and then uh, Tina Williams uh, is with us um, uh, for the eastern shore. Um, I also want to mention that uh, we just lost our um, 
Western region person who went to work for John, uh, Johnny O in Baltimore County. So um, anyway, so we are now, uh, Christina Utz is covering that now. She's the section chief for that group. So hopefully when the pandemic is over, we'll be able to replace her position. And these are the contacts um, that you can uh, go to uh, uh, for those individual locations. If, you ha if your jurisdiction has a specific um, request, uh, I deal with the more uh, statewide programs or regional programs such as states, uh, such as the Street Smart or the um, Look Alive um, regional campaigns that we do or uh, statewide uh, helmet distribution programs, uh, the kind of things that I, I get involved with. If there are local um, projects working with your local um, uh, DOTs or agencies uh, that are very specific to your jurisdiction, then our pro group would probably be administering the grant. So we would have to kind of work together on that in terms of who would who would manage the grant. But um, anyway, so that's pretty much uh, uh, the end of my presentation. And I look forward to hearing any questions at the end. And I want to turn it over to Cheryl Ladota. Cheryl? Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Marissa Linochi, and I'm the Recreational Trails Program Consultant. And today I'm here on behalf of Cheryl Ladota, the Rec Trails Program Manager, to discuss our program. The Recreational Trails Program supports the maintenance and development of recreational trails in the state of Maryland, whether they be motorized or non-motorized trails, um, either land or water based. We receive approximately a million dollars in federal funds each year from the FAST Act, and we administer the funds on behalf of Federal Highway. Um, the awards can range from about $20,000 to $80,000 with some exceptions made for larger projects, and on average, we award about $50,000 to our project sponsors. Um, we support a variety of trail uses as listed, and we seek to distribute the funding across the various rec trail types um, based on guidance from the federal program. Uh, our project sponsors are either government entities or nonprofits. And the Rec Trails program is reimbursement based. Uh, we will reimburse up to about 80% of the project's eligible costs with a 20% cash or in kind match. More detailed information on the eligible costs and match can be found in the Rec Trails program manual, um, which is available on the One Stop application site. The reimbursement of our grant funds is based on the completion of the scope of work using a combination of invoicing, construction reports, and site visits, um, and is not a lump sum payment. For a typical application cycle, applications are accepted in the spring, reviewed by our Rec Trails Program Committee, and awards are typically granted in the fall. And the signed MOUs uh, for our grant program have about a three-year expiration date. Cheryl and I, um, we provide support to provide applicants uh, or two prospective applicants and are able to discuss project ideas as well as set up site visits prior to the application submission. Uh, the program uh, funds a variety of eligible trail activities, including new construction, which may include the acquisition of easements or right of way for trail development. Um, we fund projects for the maintenance and restoration of existing trails, including equipment leasing and um, the funding of employees or contractors to maintain those trails. Um, and we also fund projects for the installation or upgrading of trailside and trailhead facilities. That can include anything from um, trail signage or kiosks, bike fix stations, soft launches for water trails, um, benches, uh, and among other things. Like, this is not an exhaustive list of what we cover. And again, more details can be found in our Rec Trails program manual or by contacting Cheryl. We do give preference to projects such as the ones listed below, but are always happy to review any project ideas with you to discuss the project's eligibility for the program and provide guidance. Um, some of the projects listed here, or project types listed here, are projects that provide linkage or complete existing trail systems, again, the construction of new trails, um, projects that improve access to land and water trails, um, provide 
uh, funding for the redesign, reconstruction, or relocation of trails for environmental benefit, projects that involve use in the construction or maintenance of trails, projects that expand opportunities for motorized vehicle users, um, and lastly, projects that enhance access for people with disabilities. For the fiscal year 2022 recreational trail program, uh, the submission window is from April 1st to April 30th, 2021, and applications can be submitted for review by Cheryl or myself if they are submitted by April 15th. Um, and if you're interested in that, uh, contact Cheryl uh, to let her know that you'd like your application reviewed. Uh, the Rec Trails Program Manual is available for download on the State Highway website and on the One Stop application page. And as part of this presentation, you'll also receive our Frequently Asked Question Sheet and Scope Guidance document. If you have any other questions specific to the program or your project, either Cheryl or myself would always be happy to assist you. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing any questions that you may have at the end. Thank you. And uh, up next, we have Christy to discuss the TAP program. I will. Hello. Hi, Christy. Can you You're hear me? Oh, so, yep, we sure okay. can. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I uh, love technology. Uh, so good morning, everybody. My name is Christy Bernal, and I'm the Transportation Alternative Program Manager, and I will be reviewing the Transportation Alternative, um, the Safe Routes to School Program, and just a quick um, quick note on the, the FLAP program. Um, so the Transportation Alternative Program is, is a program managed by MBAT SAJ and is a federally funded reimbursable program. Uh, we provide oversight to the local project sponsors for these locally led projects to ensure that they're meeting all state and federal requirements. Uh, some of the examples of the federal requirements would be the Uniform Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, as well as like, the Americans with Disability Act. The state of Maryland receives a little over 11 million yearly from Federal Highway. Uh, so MBOT SHA will have a call for application um, from April April 1st to May 17th um, to to accept those applications and from the funds that we receive from Federal Highway those funds are allocated to about 40 percent to the Metropolitan Planning Organization and the remaining 60 percent will be used to any to be able to fund any other project within the state of Maryland TA and Safe South to School are both reimbursable programs meaning that the project sponsor will need to pay for the cost of the project and then seek reimbursement from SHA for the phase that was awarded. Uh, go ahead, Nate. The Transportation Alternatives Program, as I said before, is a federally funded, it's a transportation-related community-based project um, used to improve the transportation experience for pedestrians and cyclists. Go ahead. Um, in order to be eligible for program funding, your organization uh, needs to be an eligible government agency working with transportation projects, uh, local governments, regional transportation authorities, or natural resources or public land agencies. Private organizations, community groups, or nonprofit organizations are able to apply once they're partnered up with a government agency. The project needs to be related to surface transportation system, so meaning a proximity to an existing or planned roadway or a ped bicycle corridor or enhancement of the aesthetic, cultural, or, or historic aspects of travel experience or a current or past transportation purpose. The project must meet at least one of the nine eligible categories, and funding is provided for planning, design, and construction phases. We will not fund multiple phases at once. So projects that may come in this year for design could be awarded for design, complete design, and then once, once that is completed, you can apply for construction funding. 
but we will do construct design and construction funding at the same time. Okay, go ahead. Uh, back in 2019, um, FHA made a couple application changes. So when applying for design funding or construction funding, the project sponsor should ensure that the requirements for each of the phases is being met. So for the design funding, the concept plans with design applications, um, and then we have a list of what is included with the concept plan. And then if you are submitting for construction funding, the 30% design plan, project location, map, and cost estimates for construction funding. Um, please make sure that the applications meet the, the requirements. Um, do not want to reject any application uh, because it hasn't met the, the, the basic requirement of it. Um, okay, go ahead. So as a project sponsor, um, I've highlighted some of the responsibilities of receiving the transportation alternative funding. Um, you know, from complying with all the state and federal requirements, providing at least 20% cash match, um, maintenance activities for the lifespan of the project, and just constant communication with um, my group in order to assist with the project. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so this slide basically shows the nine categories that are proposed, um, that the proposed project should fall under. So your project may fall under one or it could fall under more than one category, which is fine. Uh, go ahead. So the Safe Routes to School is a program within the TA umbrella for funding. It will fall with the same requirements for state and federal requirements. It differs since it is focused on elementary and middle school and the schools um, definitely have to be within a two, the, I'm sorry, the project needs to be within a two mile radius of the school. Go ahead. So the eligible activities uh, for safe routes to school are your engineering, so any design and construction, um, education, um, encouragement and enforcement. So if you're having, if you need like a, well, hopefully once the kids get back to school, you may need assistance with training crossing guards. So that would be an eligible activity. Um, using the local police to provide some enforcement around the school, that would be an eligible activity. Um, as far as encouragement, you're looking at, you know, when you have your, your bike or walk to school days, um, sometimes the schools provide little gifts or um, they have a contest so that, you know, little items could be purchased and be re reimbursed in your safe routes to school. Um, excuse me, the education, uh, when you're looking at um, being able to provide like bike rodeos, the training for bike rodeos, um, and providing some of the, the handouts, that would also be considered eligible. So again, 20% cash match would be necessary um, if you need to benefit elementary or middle school students and be within a two mile radius of the school. All right, go ahead. <laughs> so again, this year, we are using the Maryland One Stop Portal. Um, so onestop.maryland.gov website, it houses the TA and the Safe Routes to School application. Um, as I mentioned, the application site will be open on April 1st until May 17th. So there was, uh, the, the dates have changed from, um, actually just recently as of yesterday. So we will be updating our website as well as the One Stop Portal to reflect the April 1st, May 17th date. So when starting the application process, um, a logging account will need to be created and you can start and save the application. Um, again, just remember to in include design plans, project maps, locations with project limits, and engineering cost estimates. Um, keep in mind that when you're coming up with some of the engineering costs, especially for the construction projects, that the project needs to be advertised on email and marketplace advantage. It is awarded to the lowest responsive, responsible bidder. Materials and testing will need to be completed and the construction inspector will need to be hired. Um, so again, those are some things to kind of keep in mind when you're putting together the project costs. Um, so you have a, a, a really accurate um, estimate or a better accurate assessment. 
with the design applications, you want to make sure that you're including the concept design uh, limit of disturbance with design cost. Um, things to also keep in mind with design applications, you will be working with our procurement specialist to submit a request for proposal to ensure that all the federal language is included and it is awarded to the most qualified uh, consultant. So again, just little things to kind of keep in mind when uh, thinking of project costs and within the different phases. Uh, go ahead. So here I have a few of our resources. So we have the, our program website for transportation alternatives and safe routes to school. Uh, we have a TAPS manual that you can download and review. We hope to have our new manual um, on site by April 1st as well. Um, but the existing TAP manual will also work if you need um, to review it now. Um, let's see. The link to the guidance for local public agencies and subrecipients of federal funds, that is a great resource if you want to learn um, a little bit of what is going to be needed to manage a project um, that receives TA or Safe Routes to School funding. Um, a lot of the times, because it is federal money, you have, um, there are additional steps that need to be taken. So taking a look at that, the guidance uh, for the LPAs is a great resource. Um, go ahead. So as I mentioned earlier, I do also manage the Federal Lands Access Program, um, which provides funding for planning, engineering, preventive maintenance, uh, rehab, construction, um, operation and maintenance of transit facilities. Uh, so with this program, the applicant must own the facility and the eligible facility must be associated with a public highway, road, bridge, trail, or transit system that is located on adjacent to or provide access to federal land. Um, my last communication uh, regarding the FLAP program, I it was confirmed that they will not be doing a call for application this year. So just keep this in mind um, if you're looking at possible funding opportunities for next year. Okay, uh, go ahead. You can go ahead. All right, so this slide has my contact information. Please email me or call me if you have any questions or want to discuss uh, your any potential projects. Um, so thank you everyone for your time, and me, I will also pass this over to you. Thank you, Christy. Uh, like I said earlier, my name is Nate Evans. I am the Active Transportation Planner with the Maryland Department of Transportation. I also manage the Kim Lanphier Bikeways Network Program. And today I will give a overview on this year's, this year's program. So the Bikeways funds are, they cover in all manner of bicycle network development activities, whether it's design or construction. So the, the Bikeways Network program was developed about 10 years ago to support the development of the Maryland's bicycle network. It provides grant funding for design and construction, and it was originally started so that it could help projects get to that 30% level so that they would be eligible for, for other federal funding assistance. The program supports bicycle transportation projects to get more Marylanders biking more often. And 100% of the funds from the bikeways program come from the Maryland Transportation Trust Fund. The, uh, the bikeways program is open to uh, local governments, state agencies, federal agencies, uh, and metropolitan planning organizations. So in December of 2019, Governor Hogan announced an increase to the bikeways program to $3.8 million. Previously, it had been at $2 million annually. So those funding levels for, 20, for FY 2021 will also be good for 2022. Last year, we started a letter of intent phase that was um, useful in getting the conversation started on potential projects a little sooner. Uh, that way, with 
a letter of intent. It can be as simple as an email, just letting us know uh, your organization, the project that you're, you're looking to fund, uh, the physical limits of the project, and about how much funding you're going to be requesting. The instructions for the letter of intent are located on the bikeways page. And then you can, the bikeways page is now the resource for, for everything that you need to know about the program. We also have an application recommendations and project deliverables guidance. It's a good project or a, a good PDF to review so that you understand what uh, is needed before you apply, and then also, especially when you're looking to fund a design project, what level of design you want to have the project completed at, at the end of the grant. And like last year, bike share projects and indirect expenses are no longer eligible under the bike race program. So this year, we also went through some updates with the bike race program. As many of you know, the, with the new name, uh, the program was renamed in honor of Kim Lampier. It was done through an act of the General Assembly last year. Uh, the, it was uh, named after Kim because she was a longtime bicycle advocate. Uh, Kim was great at increasing the funding for the bikeways program, improving bike, bicycle safety on Maryland roadways. And she's also, she was also instrumental in the styrofoam ban uh, just passed in the state. So like transportation alternatives and the rec trails program, we will also be migrating to the one-stop application portal this year. The application portal was scheduled to be open on May, Monday, May 3rd, and looks to close on Thursday, June the 3rd. So we will have all of bike month to get bike waste projects in. And another important tool that we developed this year was the project cost estimator. I will provide a quick demo of the, the estimator. So it's also located in your handouts uh, and also available on the Bikeways website as a download. Uh, be sure to make sure that your pop-up blocker is off when you download it because it will download as, as this Excel file. So the cost estimating program was developed to give local jurisdictions a tool to more accurately determine what the planning level cost estimates will be for, for projects as they're starting out. So as you download the spreadsheet, you'll notice that we have an intro tab that describes the project. We have a table of contents so that you can go to the correct tab that you would need to get the estimate for the facility that you're looking for. And then we also have an instructions tab so that you can go through and learn how to use this tool. It was set up to be easy to use so that users can input a limited number of uh, features. So on the instructions tab, we've used a more complex bicycle facility such as a two-way protected bike lane on one side of the roadway. To use this as an example, for the instructions because it is one of the more complex bicycle facilities. So the, the cost estimates are derived from users inputting the length of the project, the number of intersections, and the average intersection width. And from those inputs, we're able to calculate the amount of construction quantities for, for pavement markings and for signs. And then for also, we've included any kind of separation materials in there that are going to protect motor vehicle traffic from bicycle shining. And then including, once we have the construction subtotal, we base the design and construction and permitting costs on a percentage of those total construction costs. So for these projects, not only can you see what your construction items will be, but then you can also get estimates for the planning, preliminary site investigation and then you'll take your total projects. We've included uh, an array of all manner of bicycle facilities from simple shared lanes to uh, bike lanes with parking, 
And then we also have included uh, bicycle boulevards, tab for that so that you can also uh, see the various different types of traffic calming features that you would want to use on the bike boulevard. And then also we have a shared use path tab to help get estimates for a shared use path. And these were all based on the type of terrain that it would uh, that the shared use path would be traversing. So feel free to download this off of our website or in the handout section and uh, use this tool to help get, get a good estimate for, for projects as they're just starting out. So the Bikeways Network program covers three different types of, types of projects. Uh, design is the first kind of category that we have to support projects. Design covers kind design category covers a number of different topics from feasibility studies to preliminary designs all the way up to final design. So be sure to check out the application recommendations to know just exactly what phase of design you would like to get to uh, with the Bikeways application. Bikeways program also funds construction projects. So we will fund any type of transportation bicycle project, including the uh, recently completed Frederick Douglass Rail Trail Bridge over Tahoe Creek. This is a good aerial view of, of one of the recent completed uh, projects. So the, the construction funds can go to bike lanes, trails, protected bike lanes, one thing that the project will not cover is the bicycle facility costs if it's in conjunction with a larger streetscape project that are going to include sidewalks, lightings, uh, roadway widenings, intersection retrofits, and the like. Another category we have are minor retrofits. These awards have a maximum amount of $100,000, but they can go for easy to install uh, construction projects like upgrading storm grates on designated bicycle routes. They can go toward the bicycle parking and they can also go to the installation, the purchase, installation and maintenance of automated bicycle counters. It's very important information as you're coming through with your, uh, if you got a project that you would like to apply for funding. Uh, once you have that project in mind, feel free to use the project cost estimator to get a good idea to determine your approximate, uh, approximate project costs and your potential funding request. After you've reviewed the project eligibility criteria on the website, most website, most projects are gonna be eligible for, for funding under the bike waste program. Just need to make sure that there is a 20% local match for the projects. Send us a letter of intent or an email of intent. Uh, we'll be accepting those through April 2nd. That's not a hard deadline, but that does allow uh, conversations to happen between MDOT and local jurisdictions and provide a month before uh, the application portal goes open. Applications will be accepted from May 3rd to June 3rd of this year. Uh, once projects are awarded, design projects must be completed within two years. Minor retrofit and construction projects are to be completed within three years. Again, there's the website at the bottom if you have any information about the program. A lot of your answers can be found right there. If not, you can feel free to reach out to me via email or phone. I include the contact information for Cheryl, Jeff, and Christy here as well. And at this point, this concludes our presentation. So we will open it up to a couple of polls that we'd like to get an idea of what participants from the webinar are thinking about for, for their projects this year.
So now you should be have the first poll up on the screen. And what type of grant are you interested in applying for? Here on the Highway Safety Office, Rec Trails, TAP, or Safe Routes, or the Bike Maze Program. We still have responses coming in. I'll give you just a couple seconds to answer the poll. So it looks like we have a pretty decent even split among uh, TAP, bikeways, and rec trails with Highway Safety Office coming in at about 15%. For our next poll, what type of project are you looking to fund? Options include feasibility study or preliminary design, advanced design, construction, enforcement education or equipment, or something else. A few more seconds for responses. Looks like we mostly have construction projects that are looking to be funded this year, followed closely by feasibility studies or preliminary design. Great. Going on to our next question. What part of Maryland will your project be implemented in? Western Maryland will consider that Garrett, Allegheny, and Washington. Central Maryland would be between Frederick, Prince George's, Anne Arundel, and up to Cecil. Southern Maryland would be Calvert, Charles, and St. Mary's. Eastern Shore would be south of uh, Kent County. Or statewide can be across a couple of different jurisdictions. And it looks like most of our projects are aiming for Central Maryland. It's also good to see another 25% down on the Eastern Shore as well. Thank you for your responses. Our next poll question, how much funding are you seeking? Just a couple more seconds for responses. It's like more than almost half of projects are coming in between twenty five thousand and one hundred thousand dollars. Other 25% of projects are going to come in at more than a quarter million. Great. That's great to know. Thank you. And for our last poll question, you intend to follow up with one of the grant managers before applying. Yes, no, probably, probably not, or I already have.
sharing those responses. It looks like most of you will be reaching out to us. We look forward to those conversations. And another third about probably contacting us. Well, that's good to know. Thanks. We, uh, we look forward to hearing from you all. So now we will move into a time of question and answer. Uh, we will use the questions function on the uh, go to webinar. So feel free to put your um, feel free to put your questions in there, and we will we will review those. Uh, I'm going to bypass any tech questions <laughs> from GoToWebinar and just go to some of those that are that are more relevant for everyone. Uh, yes, this uh, this recording is available. Is this webinar has been recorded and we will post it uh, later on, uh, probably tomorrow or next week, onto the Maryland Department of Transportation's YouTube channel, so that you can come back and, and review this. Question, could micromobility grants be eligible? We have a past pilot project in Baltimore City with our dockless vehicle program. Uh, that question comes from Meg Young in Baltimore City. Uh, Meg, the bikeways program no longer supports uh, bikeways program since I'll, or with those, when this bikeways program was initially set up, bike share was still financially focused uh, on um, the local jurisdictions were primarily responsible for, for most of the upfront costs for bike share projects. Uh, now with um, private micromobility services coming into play, those costs are no longer uh, as stringent to the local juris jurisdictions. So bikeway programs are no longer available for those. Jeff? Or Christy, did you have any comments on those? Are your programs eligible to fund bike share or micro mobility grants? So, uh, transportation alternatives yeah. is allowed to um, to fund a bike share program, but you need to make sure that the bike share program that the equipment is um, it meets all the Buy America requirements. Uh, Nate, yeah, I'm trying to get get off speakerphone here. Um, anyway, um, yeah, and the uh, safety, uh, the Maryland Highway Safety Office safety grants are are eligible. There's, uh, uh, we would consider those to be uh, uh, issues related to highway safety, and so yes, we would we would consider uh, you know, micro mobility um, issues. Great, thanks, Jeff and Kristen. Our next question comes from Ahmed Mohammed. Jeff, this one sounds like it's for you. It says, highway safety is a combination of both infrastructure design practice as well as public awareness and behavioral factors. How do you coordinate your public outreach effort with design aspect to reach the zero goal set? I'm sorry, to reach what? To reach the zero goal set or zero deaths. Um, well, we, we we know that the engineering, uh, education, and enforcement are all, you know, closely closely linked, and uh, so you know we look to basically dovetail into whatever is done for engineering and safe system designs with um, education efforts. Uh, we work in close partnership with SHA um, on those issues. Um, so I guess the the point that we don't it, it's just that we don't fund. The engineering portions of those projects, uh, those would be funded through SHA, uh, but we can fund the, um, you know, the education portions of whatever comes out of the engineering pipeline for improved design. Does that answer the question? Sounds like it does to me. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Our next question is from Emily Clifton. Uh, Emily asked, do, uh, do both design and construction for TAP projects need to be listed on EMMA, email and marketplace, I assume? EMMA? 
Christy, is that, uh, can you answer that one? Uh, so, yes, both, both would need to be advertised on Emma, email and marketplace advantage. You're also able to use um, your, your site, depending on what the, your, the local jurisdiction does, so we would also request that it's on, it's on Emma as well. Great, thanks, Christy. Eric Kleschinski asks, I was not aware until today that TAP funded design projects. How should we determine whether to pursue design funding through TAP or the Bike Waste Program? What is the difference? Uh, Eric, I think that that's a good question. Uh, we can likely, uh, I just, it would probably be a good idea to get more specifics on what the project is that you're thinking about uh, in terms of whether going for TAP or bikeways. Uh, since both programs do fund design, uh, it's, um, it has a, well, it has been done before where both TAP and bikeways have been used to fund the same project. Um, but I guess it would also determine, a good way to determine it is where is your project in the design phase? Uh, if it doesn't have any design started yet, any, any plan, any more in-depth planning on it, then I would recommend using the bikeways program. But if you have uh, you know, the concepts along Etc. Uh, maybe some preliminary design, 30% design. Then it may have be advantageous to use TAP depending on the scale of your project. Christy, would you want to offer any other guidance on that? Um, the, the only other thing I would just mention is that with um, with TAP, you would definitely need to advertise. Uh, for a new design consultant. You wouldn't be able to use the one that you're currently using. So you may have like an on-call contract within the town or, or, or county. Um, so that would be the only, I guess, thing to kind of consider. Um, but we could definitely talk a little bit more about it. Um, okay, thanks. Emily also asked if the temp she feels that the 10% contingency for a planning phase seems really low. Well, the contingencies are broken out differently per facility type. Uh, Emily asks, is it possible to increase or are agencies submitting proposals required to stick with 10%? No, uh, the planning cost estimator is just to get you in the right ballpark if you have the resources to drill down on your proposal. Get more accurate cost, feel free by all means. Uh, you can also adjust some of those percentages in the spreadsheet if you need to, uh, depending on the project. Uh, so while it's a great tool to get you started, it's not the end all be all. So feel free to feel free to tweak with it. Kurt Miller is asking Christy to be eligible for TA or Safe Routes to School funding. So the project location should the project location be within a priority funding area? Sorry, can you repeat that, Nate? Sure. To be eligible for TAP or safe routes, should the project be be located within a priority funding area? Um, it's not a requirement. And Kurt also asked, why are high schools excluded from safe routes to school? Uh, so high schools are excluded from the safe routes to school funding because that's just the way that the legislation wrote up all the guidance for it. Um, I know that as we're waiting for a new transportation bill to come up, I, I, we have we have been told that high schools would be included. Um, but until that, that's actually public, I, I, I don't know when that's going to be offered to high school. Now, depending on the project, it would still be able to qualify under TA near high school. 
it just wouldn't have the safe routes to school. Um, it would just be under the eligible category of PA. Okay, thanks, Christy. Next question comes from Ian Thomas. Can Safe Routes funding or any other programs be used for pop up traffic calming project designed to test pilot permanent installations to reduce vehicle speeds near schools? So, the Bikeways program has funded pop ups in the past. And if it's part of a larger effort, we can still continue to fund pop ups through the bike race program. Christy or Jeff, can your programs fund pop-ups? That's a, that's a good question because it's just recently come up this last year or so. And um, the short answer is, if it's, an ed if it's educational in nature, such as recently we were, we were involved in, uh, you know, the pop-up uh, bike facilities in uh, Columbia. And uh, we did education efforts on on that, uh, outreach ed efforts on that. Uh, we didn't actually fund the event itself. But um, I have been asked that question several times in the last uh, six or nine months. And um, if you have a proposal, why don't you uh, get in touch with me and I will float it past our management to see. I guess I would, the caveat would be if it's educational in nature that we might consider that. If it's like a precursor to building, you know, like a traffic permanent traffic calming project or something, um, it may be something we would shy away or defer to SHA on. So I, it's probably a case by case basis for us in terms of what the nature of the pop up and the goals and the objectives are. Therefore, um, for safe routes to school. Uh, I think just like Jeff said, I, I would like to know a little bit more about the, the proposed project. Um, we have not in the past funded pop-up efforts. Um, I know of other states that have under safe routes to school, so I would just need to do a little bit more, um, do some more research as to how that would that would work out. Okay, thanks. Our next question comes from Lori Hippensteel. If she has a project that's significantly under $25,000, is that an automatic no funding? Uh, no, for the bike waste program, we will we have uh, no minimum on project size, uh, but with, with um, just the 20% is required for that match. Uh, Jeff, Marissa, or Christy, do you have uh, do you all yeah, have, does, would, does your programs have numbers that they need to adhere to? Uh, no, <clears throat> our numbers are, there's no minimum. You know, we, we would consider, um, you know, small, small, small incremental, uh, you know, grants. In fact, we have a number, a lot of our grants are relatively small, five, maybe the $10,000 range. Um, and then we have quite a few grants that are in the sort of $20,000 plus range. And then a few go over, you know, over 100. But, you know, the, the ballpark being is that we don't really have any kind of uh, limits. Obviously, if we had a lot of small grants, we would have to maybe weigh in on, uh, on how that would be administered and, and uh, you know, effectively managed. But uh, the, the point is we will consider some very, very small grants, you know, you know, a couple thousand dollars maybe or something. So there's, there's no really small you know, there's no grant too small for Maryland Highway Safety Office, I guess is what I would say at this point. For TAP and Safe Routes to School, um, we are we don't have a minimum. So if it's under a certain amount, we can definitely work with that. I'm sorry, if it's under the twenty five thousand, we can definitely work with that. Yeah, thanks. And Oh, and for the recreational trails program, we do have a minimum award amount of $20,000. Um, but if you are interested in rec trails um, grant, please contact Cheryl um, and we can discuss a little bit further. Thanks, Marcel. 
Chrissy Toff asks, is, does MDOT bikeways have the same bidding requirements as TAP? Uh, they aren't the same, but they definitely follow along the same Maryland procurement process. Um, while the TAP has to also adhere to federal regulations, MDOT bikeways is not, but we still have uh, bidding requirements at the state level that need to be adhered to. Uh, Locade has a question for Jeff. If our safety project is being used at the statewide level, should we still start with the regional contact? Uh, the short answer is sure. Uh, we work, you know, I work very closely with the uh, with our regional um, or our what we yeah our um, you know area pros essentially. So yes, um, you could absolutely if you're working with one of our you know Mike Julie or uh, Tina, um, that's a good place to start. Tina has recently set up a number of um, joint phone calls with me and the, the folks over on the Eastern Shore. So um, uh, that's, that's always a good place to start. And if nothing else, just to build that relationship because ultimately that's a good resource to uh, have, um, you know, you know, program and uh, resource, you know, monetary resources and grant resources for various projects that might come down the pike in the next year or so. So um, that's always a good, that's, Absolutely, and you feel you know free to send an email and you know copy in me and and uh, send it to one of the regional uh, folks if um, if you would like to start there, that would be great. Like I said, we work closely together. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, another question for you from a enforcement perspective as a law enforcement agency, what is the typical grant amount for bicycle pedestrian enforcement measures? That one, I'm not, I can't answer off the top. I would have to uh, defer to my, um, you know, I, I have a sense of what they are, but I don't really want to be quoted here. So I, uh, do me a favor, send me an email on that, and I will forward that to our law enforcement uh, group. Uh, John Hips manages a, uh, a number of, uh, form, most of them are retired police officers uh, who are uh, working each of, each of the areas. So um, um, I can get you an answer to that, but I would like to confer with my uh, law enforcement folks. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So, Tanya Asman asked, what does the design cost reflect in the cost estimating tool represent? What percentage of design does it represent? So, the percentage of design is, a, is final design, 100% design on the cost estimator. Uh, and it includes a generalized quantity for doing that design, uh, also included in the cost estimating, estimating tool in the instructions tab and also on the intro. It includes a list of things that really do need to be considered that can vary a uh, project cost estimate at, at the beginning phases. So um, we do include for like lighting, uh, retaining walls, uh, boardwalks, uh, but we don't necessarily account for any type of unique drainage analysis that needs to be performed. Uh, it does not include right-of-way purchases. Uh, so we do include a lot of caveats in there to let to provide a little bit more guidance on what is and is not included in the cost estimating tool. And on that, answering John Swanson's question, yes, the tool can be used to uh, estimate TAP projects as well. Another question that the uh, the cost is from David Edmondson. Uh, the, there's that the bike cost estimating tool doesn't include protected bike lanes on each side of the street. Uh, with that one, David, there is a protect there is a buffered bike lane tab uh, for each side of the street that you can be that can be used. I just need to account for some vertical separators on those when doing your calculations. A uh, question from Christy Fang. Uh, we'll be updating our bikeway master plan. Uh, will it be eligible for a grant, maybe under the Bikeways Network Grant Program? Uh, so Christy, bikeway bicycle master plans are not eligible as, a, as under the Bikeways Program, but 
a strategic plan can be eligible. Uh, the difference between a strategic plan and a master plan is that a master plan takes a high level look at, uh, and at the jurisdiction and what it will take, uh, both as far as infrastructure policy and programming to help that town become more bike friendly. Uh, a strategic plan is more of after the initial bike plan has been done and you notice gaps in your system, then you can more strategically target what those next improvements will be. So a strategic plan will include some preliminary, preliminary and even up to some semi-final design of some of those areas where you want to uh, target improvements for the bike network. going down some of some of our more questions. Uh, David Edmondson asked if there are other bike funding and grant programs listed online. Will those be gone over elsewhere? Uh, not sure where you're you're finding those resources, David, but uh, we're we're covering just these four topics today. If there's other information that you find online, uh, feel free to reach out to those program managers as well. Patty Stevens asks, can you apply for two different types of grants for different aspects of the same project? Uh, that's a good question, Patty. Uh, if I'm interpreting your question right, um, if you wanted to just to apply for two different grants, one for design and one for construction. Um, that's possible, uh, but it might need to be done uh, on consecutive years. Maybe apply for design this year, with one program, and then apply for uh, construction funding another year. Nate, let, let me jump in here and say this is uh, yes. germane to some of the discussions I've had with uh, jurisdictions on the Eastern Shore recently. Um, you know, there's there's an interest on their part to be applying for uh, bike ways grants for bicycle facilities, but the question is, is that um, can that be coupled with a safety program and maybe an enforcement effort? Uh, for instance, if you have a separated bike lane that's going to be crossing a roadway, um, there might be an interest in trying to promote, you know, the importance of safe crossing activities and all that. Um, and that could be funded um, with a safety grant that would be separate from like a bike waste grant, for instance. So, so the short answer is, um, you know, I don't know how that would mix and match with some of the um, engineering design efforts, but in terms of safety programs and enforcement and education efforts, uh, we, we would uh, be very interested in trying to couple uh, those grants with engineering, <coughs> separate engineering grants. Thanks, Jeff. Lucia Anderson asked, uh, she has a, a nonprofit organization. And she would like to use bikes for therapeutic healing at the center. Is it, repos is it possible to receive a grant for, for this area? I, I know that that would not be eligible under bikeways. Uh, Jeff, Marissa, or Christy, would therapeutic bikes be eligible under your program? This is Jeff. I, I would jump in and say that it, it would have to have a uh, traffic safety component. Um, you know, it would be, we, we basically are about promoting the safe use of bikes, but not necessarily um, promoting the expanded use of bikes. Uh, it's, it's kind of a subtle nuance, um, but you know, traffic safety is what our mission is, our mandate, um, and what NHTSA wants to make sure that we're promoting with the money that they give us. So, um, so there would have to be a traffic safety component to it if we were to consider it. For Nate, for um, for TA and Safe Routes to School, I think I needed just a little bit more information. Uh, similar to Jeff, what, what other components the, the project would have. Because um, I think off the top of my head, I would say that the TA would not be eligible for. 
um, but depending on the location, it, it might be eligible for safe after school. Thanks, Christy. Just going through some additional questions. Um, Nate, this is Marty. Go ahead, Marty. Say, um, it may be an open question to follow up with Cheryl Ladota whether um, that would be eligible for a recreational trails grant. I don't know whether Marissa wants to chime in on that. Sure. Um, yeah, that, that would be my recommendation as well is to follow up with Cheryl um, so that we can discuss a little bit further. Okay, thanks, Marissa. There's, there seem to be all the relevant grant questions today. Uh, Christy, a question for you is, can you comment on the Safe Routes to School Expansion Act and how that might impact current funding and eligible projects? Um, at this time, I am not able to really, I need more information in order to be able to, to speak about it. Okay, no problem. Those appear to be all of our questions. Um, again, if you need to reach out to us with any other questions on any of these grant programs, our contact information is still on the screen. Uh, feel free to reach out to us by phone or email, and then also jump on our program websites for additional information. With that, I'm going to conclude today's webinar on MDOT grant possibilities for bicycle pedestrian projects. I'd like to thank our presenters, uh, Jeff, Marissa, and Christy, today for, for helping with this uh, webinar. And again, thanks all for attending. And if you have any questions, feel free to follow up with us. Thanks again. Have a good day.